Welcome back to Requirements Engineering. Today we're going to talk about how to scale requirements engineering for different types of projects. For that, we first have to look into factors that help us decide on how we need to tailor. And then we'll look into three different project sizes, typical project sizes that we may have to deal with and how to do requirements engineering for those. So first, the tailoring characteristics. So for scaling requirements engineering, we have tailoring characteristics. which are the indicators that help us decide on how we need to adapt the methods that we use and the tools that we use in a specific project. So first of all, we need to understand the project setting. That entails factors like, what is the time frame of the project? What is my overall budget? How many stakeholders do I have involved? How many different client parties do I have to talk to? how many different customer groups and user groups are involved. So essentially, how many information sources do I have to gather from? And then how much time is it gonna take to negotiate and come to a joint agreement on what should be the requirements? So first of all, the project setting. Then second, we need to understand what the knowledge of my team members is. So we need to understand how skilled are my individual team members in the application domain that the system resides in, as well as in the requirements engineering techniques that we will use. So from a couple of requirements engineering techniques, we know that when we look at them and read them, we think they're gonna be easy. For example, the system vision. The system vision is this like big picture with a lot of icons on there with a lot of graphical elements and just a few boxes and arrows and bubble clouds for concerns of the stakeholders. It looks like this super simple diagram, and it actually is. However, when you apply it for the first time, when you try to make one, turns out it's not all that easy. It takes a little bit of practice, and over time you get better at depicting the main message. And so therefore, the level of knowledge in terms of requirements engineering say how comfortable you are with using certain techniques matters a whole lot in scaling your requirements engineering approach for a specific project. Third one, what's the type of system that you are developing? So depending on whether this is an embedded system or whether it's a business information system or whether it's a cloud-based system, a web app, a mobile app, you may need different specification techniques. If I have a graphical user interface, I obviously need some graphical user interface design. If I have an artificial intelligence system that I just talked to, I don't need to worry about the graphical user interface design, but I do need to worry about how am I gonna make good dialogues for the system. And then number four, our business and legal concerns. So this involves certain business rules that may apply in the company that I'm developing a system for. This may involve some patent issues, some copyright issues that I still have to clarify before I can start rolling. That may entail some environmental constraints, some demands by the Environmental Protection Agency to make sure that the system that we're developing is not causing negative impact on the environment. So all of these concerns together they are the set of tailoring characteristics we need to know so we can find the right approach to requirements engineering. And if somewhere in the back of your mind you're wondering, how on earth does the type of legal concerns influence the way how I do requirements engineering? Then we just have to look into the processes that each of those entail. So if I deal with, say, a rule from the Environmental Protection Agency, that is probably written in a language that is not really conducive for software engineers to know how to design that into a system. So I may have to involve a legal person to even be able to translate that into my technical language for me. 
for certain business rules. That may strongly influence how I'm allowed to approach stakeholders and seek information from them. So therefore we see there is quite an influence on how I do requirements engineering. Now, once we know those factors, we can look into how to scale the requirements engineering approach. We'll put that on here, how to scale. And I said we'll do that in three levels. So our first level, let's call it minimalistic requirements engineering. Minimalistic RE would be something that I do in an agile context, in a small scale project. Let's say I have one, two, three or four developers in my team. I have a customer who's readily available for feedback. I have a short time span over which I want to develop the system. I have a short time to market. Let's say it's maybe a mobile app. It's a game we're developing. We are riding the wave of the latest game technology and we know we only have a window of a few months to really make money with this. After that, it's probably going to vanish from the market. So we know we don't want to spend a whole lot of time on requirements engineering, but we want to make sure we get things right because we only have a short time window. So what we would do is we would use something like user stories, which are your shortcut version of use cases that describe the black box behavior between the user and the system. And we would use a system vision rich picture. And this rich picture is important to get everybody on the same page about where we're heading. It's a jointly agreed vision by all stakeholders. And then the third part that we would need is some kind of denoting the quality requirements. So what are the expectations with regard to usability, with regard to reliability, with regard to performance of that system? Like how fast does it need to respond when I mm, get rid of one of the little enemies in the game? Or um, how fast do the bonus points have to show up in my account? And then we see from having to document only about three types of artifacts and requirements engineering, that's not going to take us a whole lot of time. Now we know that in an agile setting, I have a lot of iterations with the customer. So I'm going to make sure that they sign off on those user stories every single week and that they are on the same page with us in regard to the system vision. And that may also evolve over time. Like this is not a static thing. If we're in a moving, moving target project, uh, that can always change and adapt over time. But that is independent from having an artifact-based approach to requirements engineering because the artifacts can evolve over time. We just have to make sure that we trace the changes along with the timestamps. Now, if we size it up, one, go to medium-sized requirements engineering. And then we may have a handful, two handful developers five to 20 developers, something like that. We would have a time span of one to two years. It could be any type of system. I have some more experienced people, some less experienced people on the team. And it's clear from my description that I have to pick some certain characteristics for the system to just be able to give you an example. But your, your occurrence may vary a bit from this. And so we would need a little more detailed documentation of the requirements because we have many more people involved that we need to keep on the same page. So we want to make sure that we have the stakeholders in there in a stakeholder model, that we have a goal model, and that we then again have a system vision. and the use cases, which are a specification that has more detail than the user stories in an agile environment. So in a use case description, we have more of the background information of the context information. And then we also need quality requirements, process requirements, and constraints.
Now that, again, has more scope than the quality requirements up here. Here in the process requirements, we can also make statements about how we need the development process to be carried out. And we have the opportunity to write down a lot of system constraints. Now, from this one, if I want to scale it up further, if I have, say, a software system that will have a couple of hundred developers working on it, and it's going to run over a few years, and I uh, uh, am in a complex system domain, I'm either in the embedded domain or business information systems, all of them can grow more complex, or I have a hybrid system that includes several types as subsystems. So the third one is large-scale requirements engineering. Large-scale requirements engineering would be a project that runs for several years, that involves maybe a couple of hundred developers even, and that is a more complex system. Maybe it's a hybrid system that includes business information parts and embedded systems parts. And we deal with probably a lot of interested groups of stakeholders, and because I only have limited space here, I'm going to add the ones that are not in the medium-sized requirements engineering approach. So for large-scale RE, what we want to document in addition is a business case. And then we definitely want a more detailed domain model so we can capture the operational context as well as the business context. And last but not least, we want a function hierarchy or a service hierarchy. And that hierarchy is going to give us an overview of the black box functionality of the system, but from the system point of view. So the use cases in comparison, they were still from the user point of view, and this part is then from the system point of view. That is our plugin into the next phase, into the design. So here we have the characteristics that I need to look at to understand how I need to tailor my requirements engineering approach to a specific project. And over here, I gave you a few examples of how that plays out on different levels of complexity of your project. Thank you.